Federalist 31, Part 3. Uh, I'll start with the third paragraph. But in the sciences of morals and politics, men are found far less tractable. To a certain degree, it is right and useful that this should be the case. Caution and investigation are necessary armor against error and imposition. But this untractableness may be carried too far and may degenerate into obstinacy, perverseness, and disingenuity. So obstinacy, perverseness, and disingenuity. Though it cannot be pretended that the principles of morals and political knowledge have, in general, the same degree of certainty, certainty with those of the mathematics, yet they have much better claims in this respect than to judge from the conduct of men in particular situations, we should be disposed to allow them. The obscurity is much oftener in the passions and prejudices of the reasoner than in the subject. Men upon too many occasions do not give their own understanding fair play, but yielding to some untoward bias, they entangle themselves in words and confound themselves in subtleties. So here it says, even though morals and politics or principles of moral or political knowledge are not exactly, exactly 100% like mathematical maxims, because you're dealing with social sciences in a way. But he says if you have common sense, you use your common sense, plus you're well-read, you know what has happened in the past. You, you have uh, knowledge about experience of different societies with different people, what they have done, especially, let's say, groups when you give them too much power, what they do with it, individuals when you give them too much power. It says from all of those, you can draw conclusions that are almost, you can be almost as certain about them as you would be from a geometrical rule or a rule or a maxim in geometry. So uh, it says, even though it's not 100%, 100%, but it can be very close to it if you use your common sense, your knowledge of the past, history, and are observant. Watch things closely. Okay, I'll go to paragraph four. How else could it happen if we admit the objectors to be sincere in their opposition that positions so clear as those manifest the necessity of a general power of ta taxation in the government of the union should have to encounter any adversaries among men of discernment? Though these positions have been elsewhere, elsewhere fully stated, they will perhaps not be improbably recapitulated in this place as introductory to an examination of what may have been offered by way of objection to them. They are in substance as follows. He says, even though we've talked about this before, that it is unreasonable for these people that are criticizing and arguing about why the federal government should have the power to tax. But he says, even though we've talked about it, then we're going to bring up some other stuff and talk a little bit more about it here. A government ought to contain in itself every power requisite to the full accomplishment of the objects committed to its care and to the complete execution of the trusts for which it is for which it is responsible free from every other control but a regard to the public good and to the sense of the people so as long as the government is doing 
what it's doing with regard to public good and what is acceptable to the common sense and good of the people, it should have every power necessary to accomplish what you asked it to do, to take care of what you asked it to do. As the duties of superintending the national defense and of securing the public peace against foreign and domestic violence involves a provision for casualties and dangers to which no possible limits can be assigned, the power of making that provision ought to know no other bounds than the exigencies of the nation and the resources of the community. So when you ask the government to provide for the common defense in case another country invades our country or there is a rebellion or insurrection inside the country, you have to allow it to uh, have a way of getting the resources, whether it's financial or any other way, to take care of the duty you've given it. As revenue is the essential engine by which the means of answering the national exigencies must be procured, the power of procuring that article in its full extent must necessarily be comprehended in that of providing for those exigencies. So things happen that you have no control over it at first, you just don't see it coming, you know. You could have a hurricane in one part of the country an insurrection in another part. So all these things might be happening. So if you want the government to do its job right, provide it. Remember in the past, uh, one of the paragraphs it says, as long as it stays good to the public good and to the sense of the people. In other words, it will not go over the line and go against what the people would allow it to. It's got to have enough money to do its job. It's got to be able to procure resources, to get resources, money and different things to get its job done. As theory and practice conspire to prove that the power of procuring revenue is unavailing when exercised over the states in their collective capacities, the federal government must of necessity be invested with an unqualified power of taxation in the ordinary modes. See, we talked about this. He says, we, we have already tried asking the states for money. When he says, exercised over the states in their collective capacity, in other words, instead of taxing the individual citizens living in these states, you would go and make a requisition to the state government itself. And he says, we've seen the past few years that this thing did not work at all. So now, reason tells us, because that thing did not work, because that thing nearly destroyed us or made us weak, now we have to have we have to give the federal government, as this new constitution does, to be able to tax individual citizens when and if needed. Not that we are going to tax the citizens immediately, but he says, when the emergency happens, the situation is such that we have to think of the safety and security of the country as a whole, then we have to be able to tax people accordingly, directly. So again and again, he goes back, he says, we have already experienced this. Even at the time of the revolution, where it was extremely important for the Congress of the United States, for the National Army, to have all it needed to defend our independence or our revolutionary movement, even then states were not doing what they were supposed to because 
you had to go ask the state legislatures. But he says, since we've learned from, from that, now we're going to th ask to do things differently in this new constitution. And that's what this new next paragraph says. Did not experience events the contrary? Did not experience events the contrary? It would be natural to conclude that the propriety of a general power of taxation in the national government might safely be permitted to rest on the evidence of these propositions, unassisted by any additional arguments or illustrations. But we find, in fact, that the antagonists of the proposed Constitution, so far from acquiescing in their justness or truth, seem to make their principal and most zealous effort against this part of the plan. It may therefore be satisfactory to analyze the argument with which they combat it. So he says, we know from experience what's happened, but it seems like the people who are criticizing us are not listening and they're coming up with their own ideas and uh, just, even though it's crazy, but they just say it over and over again. So he says, in the next paragraph, or next paragraphs, we're going to see what our opponents, what our critics are saying, what the anti-federalists are saying. And we'll do that in part four.